I'm uh, going to make it a little tougher this time than I did last time. <laughs> the phenomenon I'm talking about now is the theory of the electricity, light, and so forth. And we're concentrating on first tonight light, and next time, next Tuesday, it'll be about electricity. And uh, finally, we're putting, we're, and the two of them together. And uh, the next lecture after that, we'll talk about what's wrong with the theory and why, what's the rest, what's in the world besides electricity and light, what else there is in physics, and what new questions are up. But in the meantime, I'd like to talk about light. Newton started by many experiments and observations which began this subject. He found uh, there are phenomena that are so very, very common but are absolutely sensational, ununderstandable, and almost impossible, supposing that light is made out of corpuscles or particles. Newton assumed that light was made out of corpuscles or particles because he made a mistake in reasoning. He said that he thought that the shadow edges were very sharp and that that meant that it must be particles because if it were waves that went past the shadow, they would spread into the shadow. This is a misunderstanding of exactly how waves do in fact behave. They do spread a little tiny bit into the shadow, and the shadow spreads into the light of it, uh, but not very seriously. And in fact, the wave theory of light was, uh, is much easier, finds the phenomena that Newton discovered much easier to explain. But I want to start by taking the view that light is corpuscular, that Newton had, and remind you of what these phenomena are, and then go back over Newton's attempt to explain them and see how pitiful it is. <laughs> so uh, we start with that reflection of light from a surface of glass. I, last time I used water, and I said it was 2% reflecting, and somewhere along the line I changed it to one quarter, and that was a mistake. It's glass that's a quarter, and light water that's a 50th. 2% is not a quarter. I mean 1 25th. It's <laughs> 2 percent is 1 50th and for glass it's 4 percent or 1 25th. So we'll talk about glass. The first feature is that's interesting is that from glass the light is reflected only partially and if it's particles it means some of them have come back one out of 25 and some go forward. Uh, 24 out of 25. <sighs> Uh, there are nothing hard, too hard about that. If you would suppose something is different from one particle to the other, even in their arrangement or something like that, but further experiments have all shown that all light photons are exactly the same and in the same condition, and there's nothing we can do to preset the photon to make it more likely to come back from the surface, a single surface of water, than to go forward. There's no way, and we have. Uh, well, I'll keep on going from the simpler point of view, and we'll discuss other models in a minute. But the really interesting feature is that the reflection of light from a glass surface is affected if there's another glass surface below it. For example, if you have a soap bubble, which is two water, the surface between air and water and water and, and air, then the two layers make colors in the bubble, which aren't in the water, but is produced by the effect of the reflection from the two surfaces. And if I choose light of a particular color, say, if I looked at the bubble with purely yellow light, then I would see rings or areas that are black and areas that are bright yellow, relatively. In other words, areas that reflect well and areas that do not reflect at all. In other words, the reflection from a surface, which you would expect from a single surface, can be reduced to zero by putting another surface here which common sense would imply would increase the reflection when it could in fact make the total reflection zero. And the actual reflection probability, chance that the photon or corpuscle gets reflected, varies with the thickness of the layer this way. If the thickness of the layer is zero, it doesn't get reflected at all. That's nice. No glass, no reflection. If the glass gets thicker, the reflection increases to a certain peak. 
And but if the glass is still thicker, the reflection falls again to zero, as I said, and rises and falls and so forth in a repetitious fashion. Now Newton, believe it or not, and then only working with very thin layers first, discovered this with three or four at uh, ten repetitions, and then was able by a clever experiment to demonstrate that it happened with after 34,458 reflections, uh, uh, repetitions. In other words, with a quarter of an inch of thickness, this bumpy thing kept, was still going. Nowadays, we can do this experiment in which these two things, these two reflections are separated by so far, a meter or more, and if the conditions are just right, uh, you can get monochromatic light of exactly one color from a laser, you can still see as you move this thing, reflection strong, weak, strong, weak, strong, weak from the two surfaces. So it goes on forever. Now, how can we explain such a thing from the point of view of corpuscles? I do this to show you what a fix Newton was in to explain it he thought it must be proper. First, the reflection must depend on both surfaces because it depends on the distance between them. Exactly. Or the wet one or the other surface that changed the reflection. So they're both involved. Yet it can't be that the particle is reflected from the first surface because if it were reflected from the first surface, it would never know where the second surface is and that reflection depends upon the position of the second first surface. For example, if it was reflected from the first surface, how could it be not reflected at all if there's a second surface at just the right distance. And therefore, it must be re entirely reflected on the second surface. But the reflection from the second surface is affected by the position of the first one. And therefore, it must be as follows. The first one generates an influence which, <laughs> which follows the generates some kind of a wave and a medium or something of a kind that follows the particle along and changes its disposition to be reflected or not reflected. That is, it gets the particle of, of light as it comes through can be in different conditions, either a condition of easy reflection or easy transmission, the opposite, no reflection. And whether it's easy reflection or easy transmission, is determined by some kind of an influence which propagates along from the front surface and overtakes the light particle and adjusts it, so to speak, to make sure which way it's going. Now, this uh, had a lot of difficulties with it. <laughs> it was called a theory of fits of reflection and transmission. It's not good for the following reason. You can't get along very well with the idea that it's not reflected at all from the front surface. Because suppose you had very deep water, just a little dirt in it, then you still see the reflection just as well. And if it's not reflected on the first surface, it's impossible to explain. Because that stuff which is coming, looking for the bottom surface, never gets there. And yet some light is reflected. Second, if it's all ref the decision about reflection is made at the second surface, then it should not be expected that it would be possible to alter that decision by putting in a third surface. Now, Newton did not have available the experiment in which to do more than two surfaces. But had he done that, he would have found that the amount of reflection is altered again by the presence of third and fourth surfaces. Now, even though with two surfaces one might get a, hundred, a very strong reflection, by putting more surfaces underneath, you can reduce that again to zero. So the decision is not being made on the second surface. The decision is made on the last surface. Then how does it know as it's going along whether there's going to be a last surface or not? <laughs> now, uh, Newton, uh, is a, which I would say is a genius about something. Actually, he's a teacher of something. He's the man who taught us how to do or how to think about science in a modern way so that we can make some progress. He's the one who distinguished very carefully between the facts that he would develop and experimentally determine this really happened. That is to say, what really happens is that the amount of light for brightness does go up and down depending on the thickness. And that is to be distinguished from a theory to explain why it's so. He hasn't got a satisfactory theory. He did his best. I'm sure I can tell from reading it that in the back of his mind he knows there's something the matter with him. He knows the explanation is going to get him into trouble for some way. He can feel it. 
because he puts that part in the form of queries or questions of how does it work? Can it not be that there's a part, an influence which propagates along and overtakes the light and so forth? He doesn't say there is. This is going to get into difficulty. Now you're all happily laughing at poor Newton, but you have to laugh at yourself because you live in the world and this happens and you have these very good ideas about how things happen and you can't figure out how such a thing can happen from common sense ideas. Save one possibility. It's not particles. All right? And so it turned out that uh, people proposed that instead light is waves which come down and like the waves in the sea and parts of them bounce back here and they bounce back here and the crests come together under some circumstances of timing and the crest or troughs come together under other circumstances and you get strong or weak waves going out and that's what you, what you, you see in brightness is the strength of waves. So that for many years it was all these wonderful phenomena were happily explained by the wave theory of light. And the difficulty there, the idea there was that if you had a very dim light, the wave, that would represent very, waves hardly moving at all. Just a little motion, carrying very little energy. So when they went to investigate dim light with the most sensitive instruments to see what it looked like, you found that the dim light would make an instrument like a photomultiplier or any other device that was very sensitive go off, said there's a certain amount of energy here. No, there's nothing, nothing, nothing. There's a bump of energy. The energy came in lumps. It wasn't a tiny little bit dribbling in all the time. And so the experiments with photomultipliers, which I unfortunately don't have a direct experience with, but the characteristics of them are that light is made like a corpuscle, so that although Newton's logic as to why they have to be corpuscles was wrong, it turned out he was right about there having to be corpuscles. And his paroxysms of reasoning that were produced by this thing, the torture of the mind that's produced by this phenomena, plus the fact that light is corpuscle, is, uh, had, was returned to the physicist as a real problem. And it has never been solved in a completely, well, solved in a way, in a description method by which we can predict what happens here. What happens here is that this is not the intensity of a wave, that is the amount of wiggling of the wave of some kind, but it's instead the chance that a particle comes as being counted by a photomultiplier. When I have the thickness so big, so and so many particles come back. If I sent a light so weak, there was only one particle. I send only one corpuscle, one particle of energy, one photon to the system. And sometimes it bounces back, and sometimes it goes forward, and this gives you the odds that it bounces back and goes forward. For a single layer, the odds would be 4%. This maximum height here is 8%, and 4% uh, around here, and it can go down to zero. Now, it's a, we have not been able to find any system of logic that's consonant with ordinary ideas of causality and some, you know, ordinary ideas about what things, things go. How can it not know when it's at the front surface, it's in the back surface, all that stuff that'll explain this or describe this. And so in order to keep going, in order to describe nature, we've had to generate a set of ideas which are empty of uh, a set of rules, rather, which describe how to figure out these probabilities, which are empty of models. That is to say, empty of a model of the type you're expecting. A particle is like a billiard ball that bounces against a wall and so forth. It doesn't work or that it's like waves. And what I would describe last time to you was this picture. Uh, I would say that it was in about the beginning of the 1900s that it was discovered that light, as a matter of fact, behaved like particles, which was a terrible shock after the great success of the wave theory. And then the problem of 